Marhaba Craving Palestine family. Our guest today joins us from Rome, Natalie Hamdal, who is a poet, playwright, translator, academic, and also a, a contributor in our Craving Palestine recipe book. Ahlen, how are you? I'm, I'm so happy to be here with you. I think what you've done with this whole Craving Palestine has been extraordinary. Take us through your Palestinian roots. Lama, I grew up in a deeply rooted Bethlehemite family. Everyone I knew was from Bethlehem. I, I would say Bethlehem and Jerusalem because they were sister cities to us. So, but everyone I knew was from Bethlehem. We married Bethlehemites. Uh, the only people I knew were my cousins, <laughs> you know, it was, and to me, looking back now, and this is something I discovered later, Bethlehem and Jerusalem was Palestine to me. You know, I didn't think beyond that, right? And uh, it was, but the shift was that outside the house, there was no Palestine. We couldn't say that word. Nobody knew where it was from. It was, I grew up in a time where, you know, Palestine wasn't a place you spoke about. So it was silence. And then inside the house, it was deeply rooted. And of course, we knew our history extremely well. We come from the old city. There are uh, seven quarters of the old city with clans. And I knew every single family in each clan. So uh, I had a very strong sense of identity uh, as a Palestinian, as a Bethlehemite. Uh, and yes, that continued pretty much all my life. And although we have gone through so many shifts, and I could tell you that, of course, with continuous movement, because I grew up in a very transient way. So in every space, you sort of metamorphosize, or you have to have different types of conversations, because people are experiencing you in very different ways, right. and are asking different questions and the sociopolitics of these different spaces. So you're constantly having a, a conversation between your Palestinianness and whatever space you're occupying at the time. And then there's the greater world, the changes in the world, which brings completely different shifts. Yeah. But in, in the end, I have to say that uh, I, I, I've never been confused about my identity. I've always known who I am, but I've had to, uh, have a conversation with the gaze of the other because mm. the other would have a, would always would always see me in a different way and of course that as a young girl that was extremely frustrating because I, I I had I didn't have the words nor did I understand really how to deal with those types of conversations and so at one point I just stayed silent and listened and uh, and the words came, and the understanding came later. You didn't grow up in Bethlehem, correct? No, I did not. You know, the first time I went to Bethlehem, it was, I, I can't really explain this, but I knew every street. I knew every street as if I had walked it every day of my life. It was so alive. And the culture, the people, the... What, and I, say, I specifically say that because, of course, when I later discovered all of Palestine, I started understanding, you know, uh, Nablusi culture, those who came from, from, from the north in 1948. I started understanding it and seeing. But so to me, when I went, uh, when I went over there, there was no difference. The only difference was that I grew up in a symphony of languages. And of course, when we would go back to Palestine, it was Arabic. So that that was the one thing that was different. And like I said, you know, everyone I knew was a Bethlehemite until I was the, until I went to school. And then when I went to university, that's when things started to shift because I I was having conversation with the rest of the world, and I also had to think about what did it mean to be from this place? Mm. Uh, what did it mean to be from this town? Because everybody seemed to know Bethlehem from the Bible, but nobody knew about the natives. And we had a, a lot of history. I mean, there's so much. 
to write about in this town, in these families, in this heritage. So uh, I would say yes, but I want to I want to mention that uh, not all my relatives. When you have a family like mine's, I mean, it's a huge family scattered just about everywhere in the world. Today, because of well economics change things, right? And I'm yeah. a, because we used to live in a community, in a group, and then we then all went somewhere because we had to get, we had to work. And then of course, our legal status changed. One became Mexican, the other's American, the other's Australian, you know, it, it changes and it scatters. And then from there you intermarry and life moves. And next thing you know, you were, you were one person and then you, you're probably still the same person, but your tribe has changed. Yeah. And that has, that, that, that has shifted. So people, people feel in my family all sorts of different things, but I, I am still rooted to that place. And you've lived on so many different continents. Where are you, do you consider home? Well, I would say homeland is Palestine. It's Bethlehem and Jerusalem. It's the Mediterranean Sea. It's anywhere that I can see an olive, lemon, and orange tree. Home is a family. Home is not necessarily a place. It's, it's, it's a family. It's, uh, later, it became also the cosmopolitan cities that formed me, you know, Paris, New York, London, Rome. And I guess ultimately home is in transit. How often do you visit Bethlehem, uh, Natalie? And, and what is your most vivid recollections of visiting uh, memories that stand out? Yes, absolutely. Uh, since, since the first Intifada, 1986, 87, 88 after, I pretty much have gone every year, pretty much, especially in the last 15 years. Probably my, my favorite thing to do in Palestine is walking Palestine. It's this communion with the land, because we're not allowed to live there. The communion that we have when we're there to connect to a place so fundamentally is incredible. Mm -hmm. And I go, and when I go to the villages, of course, I see these, there are um, some little water springs and children playing or, and I sit under the tree and I speak to someone having coffee. These are the most incredible moments to me. And as you know, the land is vanishing and so many of the places that I used to walk, I, I can't walk anymore because they've built the wall or they've stopped. They've, they've, we don't have access to it anymore. So uh, th those are really painful. Uh, every time I go that, oh, I can't do that route anymore because it has shifted. To give directions is a very difficult thing because every day it shifts. I'm sure you draw a lot of inspiration from your trips to Palestine. Is there any particular areas? You mentioned Akka, for example. In Yaffa, uh, being near the water, the sea, so much of our story, so much of the stories I heard when in the West Bank were pe for people who were forbidden to see the sea. The sea was so close and yet they couldn't see the sea. Experiencing the sea there, you know, it's like Jerusalem on the sea for me. This is how I, I, I feel, uh, I experience Akka. But, Perhaps in, in my work, I, I, I go back to, to Jerusalem and Bethlehem. It, it pulls me back all the time. Yeah. This is very important. And that's difficult. It's, it's difficult because, you know, visually when you're experiencing, we can only use 1% of the land. So we keep going up, right? But the whole land really, it's, it's, there's a magic to it. You mentioned you still have uh, relatives and family in Bethlehem. It's still magical and beautiful, but it's getting much more difficult, the circumstances. You know, we talk about this year has been so difficult for the world because we can't move, but yet we, we have, we still, I mean, <laughs> we still have freedom. Imagine being a Palestinian occupied for decades uh, that can't move. When I, th when I think about the, the world and the state of depression that the world is in, and I think about Palestine, I, I, think, I think the world has to pay attention here. So who can live 
in, 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 in with such a weight, with such in such a in such a confineness. It's 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 not human. It's not a natural state to live. To get to your work, uh, at what age did you identify your passions for poetry and writing? Since I was very young, actually, uh, I you know we movement was so much part of my life that I understood, I think, very early on that I could always go back to my notebook and the words, and that was going to stay there. That was sort of like, you asked me earlier about home. It was really the home I could always go back to, even if we had moved countries. Lama, I don't think I could do anything else but write. It, uh, it, there is this, there is this, it's my greatest love is, 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 um, is words. It pulls you. You can try to go away, but when something is uh, sort of etched and weaved in your being, it doesn't leave you. It seems you draw inspiration in your poetry from recurring themes and experiences yeah. related to home, travel, dislocation, and exile. Can you elaborate? This is what I know. How how uh, the the question of what does it mean uh, to exist in uh, displaced? What, what, what does it tell us about what it means to be human? What does it tell us about the world? What does it say about power? I write to try to understand this state. I, I write these things to, to witness them, to resist them and to have hope as well. When we come from a, a, a political space like Palestine, we're always, we're speaking about conflict, which we have, we have so much of, but we are also beings who, as, as Craving Palestine have shown, you know, the, the wonderful food and love that we create. We have to always go back to that as well, right? So these themes um, appear and, you know, in, in the case of Palestine, I mean, even love is occupied. Even love is occupied. If you're a Bethlehemite and you want to marry a Jerusalemite, you, you almost can't because the Jerusalemite will lose his ID to if he goes to Bethlehem and, and the Bethlehemite cannot go into Jerusalem. So imagine the most, the, the basic, most fundamental emotion. There is something that we are, we're still, it's still a force against it. So in any space that I go to, I'm dealing with this conflict. Growing up, which Palestinian poets and writers uh, did you find inspiring as a young writer? We've had remarkable, I mean, acclaimed uh, writers and poets out of Palestine. Absolutely, so many. But of course, the one that is most important then and now was Mahmoud Darwish. As a child, he, he drew Palestine for me. He was, I was able to access his Palestine and I was able to access uh, what he was giving me in, uh, in, his, in his words. What does identity mean to you, uh, Natalie? All that we are, it's how we move in the world and how others see us. And of course, it's a question of a lifetime and identity keeps shifting right it shifts constantly one thing for sure is that it's going to keep moving the, our core might stay the same but we keep shifting how do you believe identity influences your work your creative work you're speaking to people at very different levels so if i'm speaking to the arab world it's one thing if i'm speaking right. to americans it's something else if I'm speaking to the Europeans, it's something. If I'm speaking to Latin Americans, it's something else. Yeah. And the truth is that uh, ultimately I am, I'm Palestinian and that this diasporic life and all the places I've inherited was because of an exilic experience, depending on who I'm speaking to, right? But for me, for example, I, what does it mean to belong to something completely? We belong to so many different things. We are, you know, fragments can be whole. There's always that conversation that we're having in the world. So of course it surfaces in your, in your writing. Why am I reacting in that way? So it's really, it's very much to inform me this, this conversation that the world has had. And then ultimately in the end, people can have whatever gaze they want because they're, they're speaking from their own filter, right? And you have yours, you, you know who you are, you define yeah. yourself. Uh, what 
advice uh, would you have to emerging or budding writers this day and age? Read, 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 expand, explore, walk, and reserve the right to change your mind. We've been able to uh, maintain mm -hmm. our traditions, our cultures and heritage, and the fact that no matter where we are in the world, we still are very much rooted in the essence of our community. As I, I said earlier, in the family, but in the greater, in the family, it was strong and the culture, yeah. we could carry culture in, in, in it fascinates me, as, as you just said, how uh, the, the spirit of a place can travel yeah. in, in such a way and exist and endure. I was um, walking in New York City, running from one place to the other, and my shoe broke. Uh, this is a real story. My shoe broke, and I, and I was right in front of the cinema, and Bill Murray was playing in this film called Broken Flowers. And I'm like, you know what? I'm so exhausted. I can't get, I can't get further. I'm just going to go see this film and sit and then figure out how I'm going to get home without a shoe. And then there's, you know, the previews. And then the previews came up, and I'm like... Oh my, I know this place. Where is this place? I know this place. I'm like, okay, but I, and, and I, th for one minute I said, oh, is it, is it Iraq? Is it, is it Lebanon? But then I knew it was Palestine and it was Hani Abu Assad's movie, Paradise Now. And I, like a crazy person, I looked around, I'm like, oh my, oh my, there was no one, right? There was like two or three. <laughs> yeah. It was incredible because I had never heard in a in a in a mainstream place and that allow us really to now know the breadth of what it is to come from Palestine the breadth the diversity and uh and the the and the diversity of our experiences of course outside and inside and uh and each other because we were we were separated from each other so this is this 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 is really incredible. Have you worked or mentored any Palestinian or Arab young writers? Yeah, absolutely. I have been relentless in not only promoting literature from the region from very early on when I started when I was in Paris and started doing the poetry of Arab women. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, when I moved to the United States, I became a professor and I was very active in uh, the Arab community, but also in the greater, uh, let's say, Middle Eastern and Asia uh, community to, to work in translation and promotion of these writers and doing anthologies, but also in magazines and including them in the curriculum. This is very important to include them in the curriculum and also to have books from not only at university, but from earlier on uh, when, when they're young, right? So this is work I have done constantly and I continue to mentor a lot of uh, stories and you know, push those stories, try to get them published. I think our generation, especially in the last, uh, 20 years I mean when we look at uh, when we look at the actors or the filmmakers th this we we started this after 9-11 when we got together it was amazing to work with 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 everyone with this community it's a really important to to mentor and to promote and to also create new spaces know that we can now create those spaces if those spaces aren't available to us we can create those spaces this is what we did and and we can continue to do in even bigger ways. We all tend to have a very strong a connection with our tetas. Can you mm. share a story? I probably, I would give a, a, a story uh, about the kitchen really, because everything happened in the kitchen. The kitchen was where it all happened. That's where the magic was. That's where you asked me, you know, uh, it was incredible how I, I felt connected. Well, you know, it happened in the kitchen. Every gesture in cooking is a story. It's, it's, it's a poem, it's telling you something. Uh, of course, at the time when you're young, you don't know how to ask the questions, the right questions, you yeah. know, because you can ask questions and they, they tell you stories, but they, they, you know, very superficially. But we still have the memory of those gestures 
of the songs they sang, of the way they, 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 the integrity of the moment, the heart was there, the pulse, everything. It was like a whole entire homeland in history was in cooking and in that kitchen. What's your go-to Palestinian dish? I always eat maftoul or tabbouleh. This, these are my. I could, I could probably go. Okay, I could probably go on all, all day with coffee, hobbes, tabbouleh, and dark chocolate. Okay, but I have a special thing. Yeah, I have, a, I have a special thing. For, we used to call it manmaon because Pal Bethlehemites called maftoul. That's how we call it. Don't ask me where that came from. I've been searching for you for years how we ended up calling it like that but if you're a Bethlehemite that's what you call it and that's what I dream about all the time because you know we you, it has to be done homemade what's your go-to Palestinian spice za'atar za'atar oh love it <laughs> in an ideal world where would you live in an ideal world I I I, I would have a balcony uh, overlooking the sea in Yaffa. Who or what inspires you? Not one person. I think everyone has, everyone you cross has something to deliver if you're paying attention. It's That's really being good. attentive to the beats. Palestine in one word. The heart. Life in one word. Breath. Bethlehem in one word. Everything. Natalie, in one word. Bird. What is your hope for Palestine, uh, Natalie? I really hope that Palestinians, especially those who've endured, all Palestinians, but in particular those who have endured this occupation are instilled in refugee camps outside of Palestine, that they are given the rights that human rights, the rights that they deserve and um, the ability to live, the ability to be seen. I think, you know, it's such a great tragedy. It's violation of everything not to allow that. So my, my, my greatest wish first and foremost is to, for these hum human rights, for, for Palestinians, that is fundamental. And then beyond that, may we all one day dance together. Thank you so much for being a part of Craving Palestine. Thank you so much. It's a great gift and a great honor. And I feel you, I, I'm so overjoyed. And honestly, it's a really powerful experience to experience craving Palestine every day. I, you know, every day, it's like being home every day with craving Palestine. It's an incredible, incredible work.